Chapter 6, Astronomical Tools, aka Telescopes. So think back to what light is. We've been talking about light. Astronomers collect light at all various wavelengths across the electromagnetic spectrum. See if you can remember why we like to collect light at various wavelengths. So one of the ways we collect light is by using what I'm going to call light buckets to gather photons of light energy. So light buckets are our telescopes, okay? So imagine that if I had a little cup and I was trying to collect rain, okay, rain is my analogy for light photons. Well, a small cup would be really hard to gather a lot of raindrops. But if I had a huge swimming pool and I was able to collect a lot of raindrops, I'd fill up that bucket a lot faster. So astronomers use telescopes as our light buckets trying to gather photons. So the bigger our light bucket, the more photons we can gather and the happier we are. So why does it matter? So the smaller a telescope or the smaller our light, bucking, light bucket gathering device is, the less photons we can collect. So on the left image, we have a small telescope. On the right image, we have a large diameter telescope. So the lens or the mirror of the telescope is the bucket. So if we don't collect too many photons, we're going to see how an, a galaxy looks on the left. But if we collect more photons, we can see how the galaxy looks on the right. And notice we can see a lot more detail on that right image. And that's because we were able to gather more photons. So we like to gather more photons. So what kind of astronomical instruments do we have? Well, to start off, you have your eye. And your eye is an extremely portable, useful astronomical instrument. It's best for bright sky, um, large field observing. So we can go outside and look at the night sky, observe those stars that using just your eye. Now, I'm kind of joking in this sense, but they're cheap, right? Unless you have to use corrective lenses or get eye surgery. Um, but human eyes are subject to blinking. <laughs> that can really destroy your astronomical imaging. <laughs> okay, but in all seriousness, um, two major types of telescopes that astronomers use are refracting telescopes and reflecting telescopes. So refracting telescopes use lenses. Um, and reflecting telescopes use mirrors. So refracting telescopes are older telescopes typically. The big instrument, um, the big telescopes that are used for professional astronomy are now all reflecting telescopes and we'll talk why. So for refracting telescopes, they're made out of lenses, okay, heavy glass. So there's very little maintenance involved after the lens is cut and shaped. Um, but they're very expensive per aperture size. So aperture size is the size or the diameter of the lens itself. So the bigger the lens gets, the, 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 the telescope gets very heavy and very bulky, and that limits the size. So refracting telescopes are very good for solar system viewing. But we want to look at deep space. So that's when we use reflecting telescopes or telescopes with mirrors. Now they're cheaper per aperture size, meaning they're cheaper per the, the diameter size, but they do require some maintenance. Because a mirror is essentially a thin piece of glass with a coating over it, usually aluminum or gold, and that coating has to be um, re-established every now and then. So there is some maintenance required. But in general, reflecting telescopes are lighter and they allow for larger single mirrors. So they're really best for extragalactic observing. So we're going to dive into the differences between refracting and reflecting telescopes. So with refraction, you need to understand a little bit about what that means. So refraction is just the bending of a wave by virtue of a speed change. So the light I had mentioned to you travels at the speed of light in a vacuum. But light can change speed when it crosses a boundary between two substances, meaning if light enters in glass or air or water, it actually slows down a little bit. And that slowing bends the light. So notice that these images here show light moving through glass versus water, and it bends at different degrees. And this is going to be useful for astronomy because we can use lenses to bend the light to focus the light for us to see it. So here's another good example of refraction. So if we have a light wave go straight through, okay, it won't bend, okay, but it does slow down. But if a light beam comes in at an angle, it enters the glass at an angle, it slows down, and it changes direction. And that's what's happening when we have light entering our lenses through our refracting telescopes. 
So there's two major types of lenses. We have our converging lenses, which are thicker in the middle, also called convex lenses, and our diverging lenses, also called concave, which are thinner in the middle. So convex lenses are really useful in astronomy because they focus the light down to a center. So imagine these are light rays coming in and they go through the lens and it focuses the image in front of the lens. So this is the primary component of a telescope lens. Now we can also use diverging lenses to spread light back out again and often instruments will use multiple types of lenses together to form the instrument. So here's a very basic design of a refracting telescope. You have your primary lens called the objective lens. So light from distance objects come in and are bent and focused through the objective lens. Now it's hard for us to see something at this very tiny focal point. So we put an eyepiece lens to magnify the image so it's easy, easier for us to view. Okay, so we have two lenses being used to make our refracting telescope. So here's an image of a large refracting telescope. Notice the size of the astronomer compared to the entire telescope. Now this is where our refracting telescopes really have their limits. Because as the objective lens gets bigger and bigger, that focal point length gets longer and longer. So we have a problem that the bigger the objective lens gets, the longer the telescope has to be, and there hits a point where it just becomes unwieldy. They're too big, too long, and too heavy um, to really continue to operate. So instead, astronomers have switched over to reflecting telescopes. So what is reflection? So reflection is when light waves bombard a surface, then the rays reflect off at an angle. So we call this the incident energy, the incoming energy, and the reflected energy, the outgoing energy. So just like refraction, um, where, the energy, where the white waves bend, in this case they're going to reflect off. So by the law of reflection, the angle of incidence Okay, the angle that the light comes in at is going to be equal to the angle of reflection. So this is just a flat mirror here. Now in astronomy, we use curved mirrors. We use concave mirrors. Concave mirrors allow light to come in, reflect off, and focus at a focal point, which is very convenient for us. So curved mirrors are used for reflecting telescopes. So there are several different types of reflecting telescopes. So up here, you have your light coming in. So this is the telescope body. The light comes into the telescope, hits the primary mirror, which is curved, noticed, and it focuses the light. Okay, this would be prime focus. This would be a great spot to put an instrument or put your eye. Of course, it's a little hard to put your eye in the middle of your light bucket. Okay, so instead, one, time, one thing that astronomers do is by putting a secondary mirror here. Now, in what's called a Cassegrain focus, the secondary mirror reflects the light back down through the center through a hole drilled into the primary mirror. So the light comes into the telescope, reflects to the secondary mirror, and then reflects down to the center where you put your eyepiece or your instrument. You can also do one more reflection out to the side. We call that good day focus. Okay, so these are just different orientations. Now you might notice like in a Cassegrain focus, you are losing some light, right? Because you put a hole in your primary mirror, but it's not a lot. And it's really convenient to put instruments down here because a lot of in Im imaging instruments like cameras and spectrographs, they get very big and heavy. And so it's hard to put those objects right here at prime focus where you'd want to keep it small and not take away from all the light gathering power you have. So the two most common type of amateur telescopes you're gonna see are Newtonian reflectors and Cassegrain reflectors. So the Cassegrain, once again, is where the light comes in, reflects off a secondary mirror, and comes out straight to the bottom. So you put your eyepiece at the base of the telescope. Now we also have Newtonian reflectors, which uses a secondary mirror set at an angle that when the light comes in, it catches it before it focuses, and reflects it off to the side where that focal point exists and then we put a lens in just like in a refracting telescope to magnify the view for our eyes to see. That's what the eyepiece is always doing in these telescopes. It's magnifying the view so that we can see 
what is happening within the telescope. So these are the two major types of telescopes that you would probably see if you're going to purchase your own telescope. Okay, so here's a big professional grade telescope. This is about a two or three meter telescope. It's a reflecting Cassegrain telescope and you can tell because there's a hole in the bottom. So this number two up here, this is the secondary mirror. So the primary mirror down here is number one. So this is where all the light is collected and it's focused up on number two. This is the reflecting mirror and then that mirror is reflecting the light back down through this hole where the instruments are. Notice in the primary mirror you can actually see the reflection of the secondary mirror. So I told you that we have concave mirrors. So there's a couple different shapes you could have. You have a spherical shape, but the problem with that is you'll have different focal points for the light and that becomes problematic. And you have to correct that with a correcting lens. So the most common solution to this is by using what's called a parabolic mirror. So notice it's in the shape of, notice it's in the shape of a parabola. Okay, so we will grind the lens into the shape of a parabola, coat it, with a reflective surface, and that's able to focus the light to a focal point. Okay, so the next thing we need to worry about in terms of telescopes is angular resolution, which is how well you can distinguish between two objects in space which are separated by a small angular diameter. So we wanna have high resolution telescopes, telescopes that can Englishly easily distinguish between two objects in the night sky. So the higher resolution you have, the closer two objects can be while still being seen as separate objects. So if you don't have high resolution, you might be trying to look at two stars and it looks something like this. But if you have high resolution, you're gonna be able to distinguish between the two stars. So high angular resolution gives you more clear and more detailed images. So let's look at what this looks like. So here's an image of the Andromeda galaxy. On the left here, we have lower angular resolution. And on the right, high angular resolution. So with the high angular resolution, we're more clearly able to distinguish between points of light, giving us much more clarity and detail within our image. So aperture size can have a lot to do with angular resolution as well. Okay, so besides putting a lens on our telescope to directly see what we're looking at, often astronomers want to take a picture. We take pictures now with a CCD camera called a charge coupled device. Now you all own a charge coupled device in your cell phone, okay, or your digital camera. It's the same technology. Okay, pixels on this camera are detecting the photons of light and collecting them and producing an image. And this has really helped us to be able to see deep sky objects as we can collect a lot of photons on a CCD camera. Now another instrument astronomers use is a spectrometer. Just like we talked about in our last lecture, a spectrograph uses things like diffraction gratings to parse out those fingerprint signatures of the elements and objects we're seeing in space. Now we've talked about optical telescopes. What about other wavelengths like radio wavelengths? We use things like radio telescopes. Now notice it looks kind of similar with a concave dish. Okay, so radio wavelengths come in reflect off or focused at this point and then into the dish itself to be analyzed. Now, the longer the wavelength is, you gotta have the right dish size. So a too long of a wavelength couldn't be detected by too small of a dish. So sometimes we put together a bunch of dishes into an array to create what we call an interferometer, where we put together a lot of small dishes to make one very big dish. So this is the very large array in Socorro, New Mexico, where we can actually put these radio telescopes on railway tracks and separate them by three miles in all directions, giving you a three mile radius here for your big radio telescope. So when we think about telescopes, we also have to think about whether or not the atmosphere gets in the way. And you'll do this in your activity this week. So the atmosphere is opaque for x-rays and ultraviolets. We have to put those telescopes above our atmosphere. Okay, also some of the areas of radio and definitely a lot in the infrared, we have to put those telescopes above our atmosphere, otherwise we couldn't see anything. Your atmosphere, we can see through the atmosphere if they're visible and through radio and some microwaves, okay? But we still put some optical telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope up and above our atmosphere because we can put a smaller telescope out there with a lot more light gathering power because we don't have to worry about the atmosphere getting in the way. Okay, so it's always important to remember that the atmosphere can wiggle our images, give blurry images. We want to think about limiting those. So when you work on the activity this week, make sure you check that out. Okay, that's all I've got for chapter six.